some of the tryptamines, but I was fascinated by the fact, and you said to get maybe into some of the research side of things, Will. The fact that you have two basic neurotransmitter systems in upstairs in this, in this functional brain, more or less functional brain, uh, that has, that one is a, is a, is a, one is a serotonin, a tryptamine thing, and one is a, a norepinephrine, a dopamine-like uh, phenethylamine, and it turned out, as I was exploring more and more new compounds related to these neurotransmitters and making them, proving their, their, their structural integrity, their purity, and tasting them and finding out their activity, uh, the whole families were phenethylamines and tryptamines. They were the same worlds as, as the neurotransmitters. One of these little coincidences. Also found out that such things as DMT, which is one of the more interesting of the tryptamine uh, psychedelics, is a natural material in the body. Uh, it's in the in central nervous system. So technically, if the authorities wish to, to become real pushy, we are all subject to arrest for being transporters of a Schedule One drug. Because <laughs> it's in the spinal column. Yeah, it's in, that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that would be a, a defense I'm sure the government would cover. But, from the <laughs> um, but we, and another thing that I found to be an interesting little tidbit on this was that the DMT, when you have taken the experience, with most psychedelics, you try to repeat it or follow it up a little with a, with a follow-up, you have become a little bit immunized to its effect. You become a little bit um, less responsive. With DMT, not at all. So I feel the DMT is in the brain and in the spinal system, in the, in the uh, neurological system, of the, of the, as playing some role. And since it plays a normal role there, the body does not become uh, tolerant to it. It, it keeps its, its activity full, full amount. Uh, so again, what is, what is it doing in the 5-methoxy-DMT? It's, it's in there as a natural component inside of us. I'm wondering if many of the neurotransmitters, if taken under certain circumstances, would be psychedelics. Do we indeed have psychedelics in us for a reason? Um, uh, Terence uh, McKenna went into a beautiful direction in this on the on the argument that maybe the uh, the psilocybe family, the the mushroom family, uh, could have been used by early early man to be able to see more accurately and see the distance to be able to see down there. Oh, there's where tonight's dinner is. Whereas the other people who did not have this these visual acute this visual acuity would not have had that quite that survival value of knowing where dinner is coming from. And I told him about a study that had been done in in um, Ohio years and years ago in which uh, the, uh, this very neat fellow who did a lot of work in humans with, with psilocybin, psilocin, uh, gave uh, a, 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 developed some sort of a, a projector that would have and cut out the bottom 10% of the bottom 10, 20% of the, of the typing of a text. So you have a, a written text of which you can only see 80% of it or 70% of it. And he'd eclipse more and more of it to find out which point a person cannot understand what he's reading because he's not seeing enough of the letters to know what the words are. And so he got this thing and he found, here's, here's this guy's a 28%er, this guy's a 32%er. Gave them psilocybin. And under the influence of the psilocybin, they became much more able to read what was not there and with a great deal of accuracy. Hmm. And uh, it's, it's weird. And was, as the drug dropped off, they've lost the, the ability to, to see what was being eclipsed. So the idea of, uh, of Terence's argument of seeing in things that are not normally visible because of this would be a, well, of course. On the other hand, uh, if you could see things of such beauty, uh, you would see your reflection on the, on the beautiful tooth of a saber-toothed tiger, and you may not be part of the gene pool later. On. <laughs> so there, there may, be, may be negatives of being responsive to endogenous psychedelics, but I believe they are in there in quite a bit of number, and we've learned to live with them. And um, how much more, Shagun, do we go on? Do you want to, do you want to fill on some? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can tell. I can tell. Let me tell one one experiment we did. That is again a measure of, of uh, this was back in the marvelous days when uh, we had this Lawrence Radiation Lab had a little branch down in, in uh, UC campus called Donner Lab, and things were totally relaxed. This is back in the '60s. You have no idea how relaxed things were up there. They said, "Stay if you want to do some things on these instruments, but be sure you lock up when you leave." <clears throat> we had the key to the cyclotron, we had the key to this, key to that, we could do almost anything we wanted, just don't break it. If, if it's interesting, publish it, and lock when you go. And I remember one time, uh, I was working with a fellow from Germany, and uh, his wife, who was a, quite a chapter, in, that's part of your story in Pical, is 
her and him. That's not, uh, yeah, the, that's another whole story not to be gotten into here. Uh, what we did, we made up some uh, bromine labeled, bromine 77 and bromine 82 labeled uh, DOB. It's a very simple to make. With it had uh, has a not not a very good. It's not a gamma. Uh, it's a gamma emitter, not a not a, um, a positron emitter. So we couldn't use the positron camera, but we sure could use the gamma scanner. And we had this this bench that moved on wheels over the uh, ga the gamma detectors. So you put the patient. We are the patients. We put one of us, whoever is the subject, on there and scan it over the the counter and up over in the side of the of the lab. There's an oscilloscope that would give you scans of what is going over the, the counter, and you'd see a scan of, of, of your body. And you inject it here, a little sloppy injection. You have a little bright spot near the elbow, and one or the bladder slowly gets larger and larger. You keep scanning the person as the chemical is in them to see where the chemical goes. Not the chemical, but where the label of the chemical goes. Bromine, in this case, was the label. And we would scan, scan this, and notice with the DOB, which is an unusual psychedelic, this was, I had made it about two or three years earlier, first time. Uh, it is very slow to come on, three or four hours before you're really getting into the effect. And it's, the effect is still there 36 hours later. Very slow, onset, long duration, and a, a slow fading away. What we noticed on injecting this intravenously, uh, that the thing would, would not make it to the brain. The, uh, the bulk of the radioactivity, not the bulk, the most... Uh, sensitive organ to accumulating the radioactivity, I think it was a few percent, I can't remember the numbers, was it lung. It went to the lung. And there it settled in. And uh, we had to wait a couple hours later, three hours later, we noticed the lung levels beginning to drop off and the brain level was starting to go up. So apparently the lung is, is a real potent metabolizing organ. And so it suddenly occurred to us, my golly, that thing is not going into the brain and doing its thing. That's why it's slow in onset, why it lasts a long time. It's got to go to the lung, and the lung then converts it to something. But we only can see the radioactivity, so we don't know what the compound is, except it still has radio bromine in it. And uh, we kept collecting urine specimens and uh, found no ionic bromide, so this was not, it was not being hydrolyzed off. But somewhere in, in the body, in the lung, this compound is metabolized into something 